I'm John Henry Weston. Thanks for joining me on Truth and Lies, the show where we work together to shed light on common misconceptions and come to a fuller understanding of the truth. In my work in media, I have found it essential to speak the truth with love, love for all people, because we are all the children of God. I want to make a warning with this week's topic because it is of a sexual nature, and so viewer discretion is advised. And with that in mind, let's have a look at this week's topic. Is masturbation good for you? I know you've probably heard that before, but do you agree? Do you disagree? Is that your opinion or the opinion of someone you know? Perhaps you've not had a chance to think about this issue very much. Well, today is our chance to think about it, to learn about it, and to talk about it. Within this topic area, there are many lies that have seeped into our culture. Here are a few of them which we're going to address on this program. Do you think masturbation is normal? Hey, everyone I hear talking about it says that it's totally healthy. Who do you think masturbates? Um, yeah, everybody does. Do you think masturbation is harmless? I'm pretty sure it's harmless. I mean, there's no one else involved. It's just you. What do you think is the benefit of masturbation? I think it can help stop people from acting out dangerous fantasies by giving them a release. Do you think masturbating is a good thing? I read somewhere that masturbation is like prescribed to help patients in mental hospitals. Can't be that bad. Do you think it is important for someone to masturbate? It's the only way to fulfill your sexual needs if you're alone, if you ask me. With repetition, the brain can learn to prefer sexual fantasy and masturbation to real sexual intimacy with one's spouse. In fact, the brain's arousal circuitry can become so dominantly wired for self-sex that physical intimacy with a spouse can become increasingly difficult and eventually impossible. The desire and motivation to pursue sex arises largely from a neurochemical called dopamine. Dopamine amps up the centerpiece of this primitive part of our brains, which is the reward circuitry, is where one experiences cravings and pleasure and where addictions are developed. The evolutionary purpose of dopamine is to motivate an individual to do whatever serves his or her genes. The bigger the squirt, the more something is wanted. No dopamine, no want. Sexual stimulation offers the biggest natural blast of dopamine available in a person's reward circuitry. Dopamine is sometimes referred to as the molecule of addiction because it plays a central role in all addictions. Although some consider dopamine to be a pleasure molecule, this is not accurate. Dopamine is all about seeking and searching for rewards, the anticipation, the wanting. Dopamine provides the motivation and drive to pursue potential rewards or long-term goals. Although controversially, it appears that the final reward or good feelings arise from opiates. Put simply, dopamine is wanting, opiates are liking. Psychologist Susan Weinshank explains that the neurotransmitter dopamine does not cause people to experience pleasure, but rather causes a seeking behavior. It is the opiate system that causes one to feel pleasure, yet the dopamine system is stronger than the opiate system, individuals seeking more than they are satisfied. Dopamine surges from novelty, a new car, a just released movie, the largest gadget. Dopamine levels rise exponentially. As with everything new, the thrill fades away as dopamine plummets. In one Australian study, researchers showed the same erotic film to test subjects. The individual boredom experienced by the subjects indicate a decline in dopamine. With just a click, the need for novelty by dopamine can easily be met through internet pornography and is enticing to the reward circuitry. Research confirms that the anticipation of the reward and novelty amplify one another to increase excitement and rewire the limbic brain. Internet porn is what scientists call a supernormal stimulus. These are stimuli that are exaggerated, perhaps synthetic, versions of normal stimuli which we falsely perceive as extraordinarily valuable. 
To speak more about masturbation and its effects, we have in our studio Dr. Monica Bro. She is an expert on sexual addiction and appetite formation, pornography, and Catholic sexual ethics. Monica, if you could, uh, tell us what research you found on this topic. Well, first of all, when it comes to research, somebody has to want to look at the question, and people have to sign up to investigate the answer. Uh, I, I really found it difficult to find research on masturbation mm -hmm. done in the United States. People don't want to know. But uh, there is good research outside of the United States. People mm -hmm. will look at things and uh, choose to examine uh, things. I have presented before on the uh, quite a bit of scientific evidence about masturbation and its correlation to depression in women. Mm. Uh, I'm sure that the, the scientist who's studying masturbation in women is trying to encourage intercourse instead. And so he continues to do good studies, very good studies, and show all this um, proof that scientifically uh, there are reasons why uh, women that choose masturbation over what our church says is moral, which is intercourse, um, mm. that they have more physical health problems and more psychological mental health problems. Mm. So uh, that's a one area. Now, I suppose people don't want to know what things happen with men with masturbation. But as part of my practice, both with individuals, groups of men, and marital counseling, uh, on a weekly basis, I'm talking to men who are struggling with the fallout, the consequences of masturbation in their own lives. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning earlier in our prep that this, uh, that masturbation, particularly in men, could have some very damaging effects, if you could explain that. Yes, uh, I would use the words appetite and sexual appetite that men have a desire for certain things, you know, in their appetite. And I've explained that frequently as what they've been exposed to, plus their experiences, good and bad, and then their expectation, uh, what they expect will play into that appetite. Um, what the studies that I have seen show is that men who had a sexual appetite only for women mm -hmm. after many uh, acts of masturbation, uh, you know, um, they now have appetites for other men, for children, for animals, for objects, uh, as a result of what they're actually looking at that they visually attach to at the time of climax. We have evidence of this classical conditioning in men since the 1960s when they first showed that men could learn to have an erection to a drawing of a cowboy boot, even a slide a picture of a penny jar uh, after enough con conditioning where men are looking at a particular image, whether a penny jar or a drawing of a boot, at the time of climax, then they will develop a sexual response and actually uh, respond physically to these non-sexual stimuli. Mm -hmm. And that evidence of classical conditioning is at the root of how we treat sexual dysfunction in men, recognizing that they can learn and unlearn mm -hmm. um, sexual desires and behaviors and appetites. Very wow. strong. That's actually related to a field that we all hear about. Everybody talks about having a certain sexual orientation that's so grounded and fixed it'll never change. But what you're saying is that the research has shown that you can be morphed into whatever type of sexual orientation to inanimate objects even based on conditioning through masturbation to various objects. We have the, the basis of treating sexual dysfunction. So if someone says, I have a sexual appetite that I don't want and mm -hmm. I need help in therapy because I'm not comfortable with this. Mm -hmm. the, the basis of the behavioral modification techniques we use is the assumption that this was learned and can be unlearned. Oh. Classical and operant conditioning are what are used in the techniques. So yes, this idea, I think that there are many men you know, I, I like running men's groups because it gives them a chance to hear each other say, yes, uh, because of my own behavior, I now know that it has something to do with what I want now. Now, I say that most people were exposed to sexual behaviors that they didn't choose to be exposed to. Mm -hmm. You know, we are not in control of what we've been exposed to. Right. And in this culture, which is so sexually abusive and seductive, especially to men, um, 
they've been exposed to things they didn't choose to be exposed to. Then the experience, there's the positive and negative experience. Typically when people use the word orientation like you did, uh, people immediately start thinking about homosexual versus heterosexual and um, the experience of feeling loved by somebody coupled with a sexual behavior is a huge piece of why people believe that they are interested in something. I have seen studies that show 78% of men who have sex with men say that they had a childhood sexual experience, meaning as a child, an adult male was sexual with them. Mm. That adult male probably paid more attention to them, gave them more gifts, said more kind things, spent more time with them. So that experience of feeling valuable, beloved, wanted and chosen, you know, that happens, uh, that all plays into it. It's not just that somebody had an experience and it was positive as far as physically pleasurable, it could be emotionally motivating, mm -hmm. so. Right. I think one of the keys that you mentioned, and, and, and really to give hope to people, because I think, as, as you were saying, I think there's a lot of men particularly, and probably nowadays a lot of women as well, who really do struggle with this, who don't want to engage in this behavior, who nevertheless feel like compelled to do it. But you mentioned there is freedom, there is a way out. Yes, what happens is that people are using masturbation as a way to cope with emotional problems, emotional mm -hmm. regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and as they do so, they lose more and more control over their impulses. So they wind up with really needing some techniques for emotional regulation and, and techniques for impulse control. And um, most of what people know to do uh, either is minimally helpful or possibly adding fuel to the fire and making it a little worse than it was. So, wow. Can you give us an example of what you mean by em emotional problems that they would use as a coping masturbation or as a coping mechanism for? Well, typically, um, especially with men, I find that if they are not really taking care of themselves, not uh, getting the, the pieces of spiritual balance, you know, uh, I call it orphaning themselves, actually. They're, they're just not taking care of themselves emotionally anymore. And so now they feel very entitled to something for relaxation or pleasure or mm -hmm. whatever. It's a, a cycle. And people that are caught up in self-pity or focusing on themselves, it's because they're not doing things that they need for self-care. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the programs I have for men, we start with that, you know, how this culture has really emasculated men and they're looking for masculine confidence. and tend to pretend they're wanted and chosen while masturbating. If you're pretending that you're becoming an astronaut, you're, you're not building any skills to become an astronaut. Mm -hmm. So this pretending that you're wanted by someone, chosen by someone mm -hmm. during masturbation is not building the skills, the relationship skills to actually meet that Okay. No, that need for loneliness or whatever is going on. Sometimes mm -hmm. just they don't know another way to handle boredom, have forgotten, you know, the activities that used to help. Yeah. And it's good if men remember times in their life where they weren't struggling with masturbation, what were they doing? Mm -hmm. Often there's some kind of activity that they've put aside or stopped doing. Mm -hmm. And usually they'll say, well, now I'm married and have children. Well, uh, you can't give to them what you, when you don't take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. They always say, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you help someone on a plane. Yeah. So I invite men to look at going out and putting back into your life things that really build your confidence and meet the need for, um, con you know, to combat that entitlement, sense of entitlement. I should have something. Yes, you should have something. Something that really makes you feel good about yourself when it's all said and done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so in your, in your therapy, you, you actually have... Uh, you do counseling yourself, you yes. do it even online so that yes. people have, lots of people can have access. Right. I offer counseling in other countries through Skype and video conferencing. I offer phone, primarily I speak to men on the phone for 30 minutes, giving them techniques they can try. And then they tell me if that was helpful or not. And it helps me to guide them further with the kinds of things that may address their particular issues, whether it's issues of emasculation, whether it's impulse control problems or emotional regulation problems, um, and just practical techniques. They don't have mm -hmm. to disclose much to me at all. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them I will ask, when's the last time of acting out? But that's about it. There's no uh, disclosure or details. There's nothing pornographic in the counseling, um, mm -hmm. really giving them something to try 
and finding out how that works. And pretty quickly, you can uncover what is it that they really need, what's the, the basis of the problem, what's going on. Hmm. And almost all the time, I would think, it's related to pornography, pornography addiction type of stuff? I would say almost all the time it's related to emasculation. <laughs> More oh, okay. than even, you know, I have this uh, program for men, and mm -hmm. uh, every single man can talk about not having masculine confidence, whether he got in an accident and lost his physical abilities or his okay. wife has left or whatever. Uh, I would say pornography is a big piece of it because mm -hmm. it helps people believe that it's facilitating that feeling of connection. Mm -hmm. um, they believe they're learning about sexuality, which pornography is toxic sexual miseducation. It's just mm -hmm. the wrong information. You're learning the wrong thing. Absolutely not learning how to engage somebody in sexual behavior as a primary focus on the self. And that's the other thing with masturbation. With all the focus on yourself and your pleasure, mm -hmm. you're actually damaging your relationship skills. So you get further behind uh, in actually getting what would it, it take to build confidence in yourself as a man. Right. Now, I think today with the advent of the internet and, and all of this sexual culture that we live in, uh, a lot of people, probably particularly wives, are struggling with this issue, seeing it in their husbands, seeing their husbands resort to pornography and masturbation and um, uh, like less interest with that. And this is really hurtful for wives. Have you seen any of that? Yes, uh, the, the women um, make the wrong sense out of it and give the wrong advice because uh, men and women are so different, uh, so completely different in their sexual arousal patterns and their understanding of, of uh, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So women interpret it the only way they do know how to interpret it um, which is the way they experience a sexual arousal. And they will actually encourage some very damaging practices um, mm. in the men, uh, give advice that's that's difficult for them. Or uh, The biggest problem is that I, if, if I could teach people one thing, and I try to teach the priest and the men in my groups, is uh, don't share intimate details about your sexual behavior with your wife because she will never stop interpreting it as whether you love her or not. Hmm. Women completely get caught up in what we call co-sexual addiction, which is a belief that sex is the most beautiful expression of love. And so then a woman will interpret her husband's sexual behavior as a measure of his love for her, seeing him as shopping for other women and her not being good enough, all kinds of interpretations that never cross the mind of the man who's masturbating. He, he's not thinking about this being about not loving her or hmm. thinking of someone else. Um, typically, he's dealing with erectile dysfunction and some loss of confidence in himself about what's the matter with me. Um, men typically don't know that anything that causes anxiety in them increases their sexual arousal. And so disturbed by that, they continue to research, <laughs> which of course complicates the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and operating on what they know to be true and trying to incorporate what a woman's telling them is true without looking at how different uh, that is. I typically start every talk, even a small talk, showing a picture of the male brain and the female brain when hungry and how different it is. Hmm. We have no idea what it feels like to be the opposite sex and be hungry. And we certainly don't understand sexual arousal from personal experience in the opposite mm -hmm. sex because it's a different side of the elephant. Wow. So when, this is very interesting because very often it is said, I, I think usually so, that you need to have your, your spouse be your accountability partner in dealing with this stuff, and you're saying no way. Well, I, I mean, this has been, uh, pornography has been a leading cause of divorce since 2008, more mm. than half of the marriages. And I really do see, you know, firsthand marriages falling apart once the Wife starts questioning, questioning, and he starts disclosing because everything he discloses, she interprets. Uh, women think with 10 times more white matter than men, which means they connect the dots and they make it mean this and mean that and everything a man never even thought it meant <laughs> or could think it means. And she never stops obsessing about how to interpret it. And mm -hmm. she can't, there's nothing she can do about that. That's the way she's designed is mm -hmm. to try to connect the dots. Whereas men think with six and a half times more gray matter, they're very focused and this is just about this. It's not about all these other things that she's talking about. So it's very bad advice, actually. Uh, and women do get very angry, you know, but 
I've just seen them damage their marriage so much more when they find out about their husband's behavior than his behavior ever damaged the family or the children. Typically, men's behavior is private and hidden and secret. And then when the woman finds out about it is when you really see this huge explosion. Uh, she'll tell the children what he did. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I beg women right up front when they find out not to start you know, making sense out of it because they're using the only thing they know. It's similar to the blind men and the elephant story. The woman is holding on to a part of the elephant that doesn't appear to her like anything the man's talking about on another side of the elephant. Mm. Um, and so they, they're they confused about that. That's why it's good to show the differences, the brain differences, that sexual arousal in women occurs in the frontal lobes where we have our emotions and our planning, and for men in the visual center, in the back of the brain. So whenever a woman says, when a man's looking at something and she says, what are you thinking? What are you planning? It's because she can't look without thinking and planning. She can't look without feeling and mm -hmm. emotions. And he says nothing, just looking. And she says, you're a liar. And so <laughs> she has no understanding of those brain differences uh, mm -hmm. of what's happening for him. It's an amazing revelation. I, I think most of our viewers uh, will be able definitely to identify with that, the, the totally different viewpoints, the men being sort of hyper-focused from a woman's perspective and a woman being so connected to dots that is far beyond what men are used to. Right, and then um, he just thinks that those dots she connected are true and he tries to make sense out of what she just told him the story's all about. And then he tells her a little more because she pressures and pressures and she connects the dots further. And I, I, it just is a mess. It's a big mm -hmm. mess. Men need to be turning to other men to make sense out of it and learning some things that are very helpful to know mm -hmm. about how did you get this appetite? What happened? What did masturbation do for you? Mm -hmm. And how can you stop it? You know, identifying really what it's about and how can you deal with it um, in a way that's conquering the problem. Uh, masturbation is an impotent conquest. You know, men have a natural drive to conquer something. Mm -hmm. And when it's all said and done, and they pretended to conquer something, when it's all said and done, they know mm -hmm. that they didn't conquer anything and their confidence goes down even further, less and less of a, a feeling of a good feeling about themselves as men. I think this culture was so oppressive to women and then we started fighting that so much that now it is an extremely emasculating culture. I have some black and white movies from the recent past where the men were always violent and drinking and smoking, but you know there was an image of masculinity. If you think about your fathers and your grandfathers, they basically had a job and provided money. They weren't in any way expected to change a diaper, help with housework. It was really easy for them to have confidence in themselves as a man. The men today, there is no model. There's nothing. I mean, I'm grateful that Pope John Paul wrote about the dignity of women, but nobody wrote about the dignity of men. Mm -hmm. So there's no model of what is it to, to be a good man? What do you have to do? Mm -hmm. So you're pretty much stuck with whatever your wife says. <laughs> and then the list never stops because she's frustrated that it's not working. You're frustrated that it's not working. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have uh, some kind of a, what is a, what does it take to be a good man? Mm -hmm. uh, and the men's groups are out there. They're trying, you know, they're meeting. Many of the men I counsel say they're band-aids. They're not addressing, you know, what what men are needing because they don't know what mm -hmm. it is they need. And, uh, I, you know, I hope that very soon there can be more opportunity to sit together with other men and talk about some ways to to change this, mm -hmm. some ways to distract themselves from the things that have taken over control that they're enslaved by. Mm -hmm. uh, and distraction is a pretty easy technique. And, and uh when men tell each other how they distract themselves and how they start reacting differently. Mm -hmm. um, I have a little saying in my group, strengthen your heart to suffer, to act, and to be silent. And I think most of the men like to talk about when they were silent instead of saying anything in the middle of something and how much better it turned out. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, think of good St. Joseph, you know, there's not a word he spoke and uh, he had a rough job, huh? <laughs> What, in, in, in your practice, what you've seen, what has helped some of these men? What are some of the techniques that they use for distraction? What are the, what is a vision of a good man, a, a, a positive vision of a good man? 
Well, I think first of all, men have to look at what were some things that they did in the past that helped them feel good about themselves. And that's different for each man. And mm -hmm. try to put those things back in. Or maybe I have one guy in the group that's a grandfather. He said he always wanted to ride a motor motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And he finally went out and bought one. It's just like never doing what you wanted to do or what you used to do, leaving it behind. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of men go to work, come home, try to do what they're supposed to and don't really have... Um, somebody directing them mm -hmm. to take care of themselves. The, the balance would be to nurture yourself, you know, have some time cut out for making you feel good about yourself, uh, to worship, and then to take care of your family, your community, if you're in religious life, your community, and then a mission, something that you do outside the family to go out. And, the, and then men will typically identify their lack of balance in those four areas, mm. that they're doing too much mission and not enough community or not enough taking care of themselves, which is a big one. Um, the, the biggest technique that I push, and it's available on my website, is called the Stop Letter. I learned it in 1988 from Dr. Patrick Carnes, who's written multiple books on sexual addiction. You write a note to yourself. These days I say write a text message and set it as an alarm four times a day. Hmm. And you tell yourself what to think about and what to do just to distract yourself just to distract yourself. Hmm. If you think about the basis of the AA program, the Alcoholics Anonymous, they have three major distraction techniques. Call a sponsor, go to a meeting, or read your big book hmm. when the stinking thinking starts. And so if a man makes a decision that he's going to interrupt his natural fantasy process, natural mental process, he needs to know what is he going to do, what is he going to think about, and what is he going to do. And it can be anything. It can be as simple as stop, um, think about what you're going to do Saturday and take a sip of water. It doesn't really matter. Just hmm. something to distract himself. Walter Michel did 35 years of research showing that people who can distract themselves easily handle stress the best. And I mean, people are doing what they're doing to, to, to cope. Mm -hmm. They're trying to manage stress. Uh, actually, the studies that I have that I showed you, mm -hmm. the people that manage stress the best are those who don't masturbate. And that's all documented only in women because we only look at women. Mm -hmm. They not only, uh, their blood pressure doesn't rise as much, but they also recover from stress more quickly uh, mm -hmm. without that, uh, the, the, the physical and mental health problems caused by man masturbation. Um, I think to write the stop letter, you have to do what we call fire drills. You have to reprogram the brain. Mm -hmm. So our, our brain is programmed by our habitual thoughts and habitual behaviors. And we can reprogram that. If we do a fire drill, we're practicing moving our body to safety so that mm -hmm. in a moment where we can't think, we'll do it automatically. Right. So if you make this little note for yourself, stop, slow down my breathing, think about, I don't know, anything, it doesn't matter, and do this and we read that four times a day, then in the moment of temptation, we kind of just trigger this new mm. neural pathway that we've built. Right. So if a person writes a stop letter and puts it down and doesn't read it four times a day, they've wasted their time. Uh, okay. It's building a habit, building a new habit of thought, um, no matter what you tell yourself to do. But it's self-directed, so you won't resist. Mm -hmm. You can tell yourself anything you want. So basically thought, basic thought interruption. I mm -hmm. think about the scripture verse, take every thought captive. You know, mm. that mm -hmm. you're just going to enter into a spiritual battle yeah. uh, and stop denying that there's evil, that it's everywhere, and that we must deliberately, willfully make a plan. Women will always tell you, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, share your feelings. Did you talk to your son? What did you say? Did you ask? You don't have to do that. You don't need the words. What men need is fathering, and fathering happens with a man being around, just the presence. The dream does a little remix. As your eyes move right and left, you're mixing a little bit of reality with a little bit of not reality, and yet you feel better about it when you wake up. Women don't have a need or a desire to conquer something. They don't have a huge need, men do. Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, Jesus has the victory. We all have a call, a call to greatness, a desire for it. We want to do something good. Now is your time. You could change the world, and the world needs changing. So get busy. Shalom World, God's own channel. People are using masturbation as a way to cope with emotional problems, emotional regulation. 
don't share intimate details about your sexual behavior with your wife because she will never stop interpreting it as whether you love her or not. Most people were exposed to sexual behaviors that they didn't choose to be exposed to. It's very interesting. I think what you said, I mean, it relates to me. I have, I have a sexual past and in, in sexual aberration. And one thing was very, very evident. It seemed that sexual thoughts and illicit practices come, it's sort of like a wave of thought and it's like overtaking you. And I remember, you, and it's, it's not like it leaves, by the way. Uh, I think we struggle with that for the rest of our lives. But they are, there are thoughts that come like an attack and you're like, whoa, stop, make it go, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes very, very difficult. I remember uh, when I, I have a past in psychology as well, and I was in class once, and we were learning about aberrant thoughts in a totally different context, but you know, with obsessive compulsives. These thoughts come in and they like attack and they're there and they continue and you can't get rid of it. So one of the techniques we learned in school was this uh, mantra. You, you say something over and over, short phrase usually over and over and over and over and over again, so that it takes over your thought. And they also said, in addition to saying something, add in a visual. And so in class, the example was, pink spotted elephant, pink spotted elephant, pink spotted elephant, and visualize it. So you'd have that uh, mantra be able to take over your thought. And so I went home and I was telling my dad, oh, this is really great. We have this technique to overcome compulsive thoughts and uh, really works really well, watch this. And he said, whoa, 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 we've been doing that in the Catholic Church for some 2,000 years. And I said, what are you talking about? This is psychology, you know? And he said, yeah, well, mantras are short prayers. He was German, so they were Stoßgebete, and in English we call them aspirations, and just short little prayers like the name of Jesus or Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I love you, save souls, said over and over and over again, and visualization, yep, the crucifix or Our Lady or whatever, to give yourself these, this ability to regulate your thoughts to take them over. So I was thinking, oh man, but anyway, so you were saying about this. Um, part of what I do is help men mm -hmm. understand when they're in emotional overwhelm, mm -hmm. when it's really that their feelings have kind of become too much for themselves. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why these thoughts would come out of nowhere is you're kind of in a, not recognizing it, but a little too scared or a little too mad, you okay. know, a little bit uh, traumatized by your own emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, emotional overwhelm is a term John Gottman uses. He's a marriage expert for the mm -hmm. nation but um, there's in when we're sleeping and dreaming we have what we call rapid eye movement where our eyes move back and forth and there's some resolution during our dreaming you know have you ever had something that bothered you and you dream about it and the dream does a little remix as your eyes move right and left you're mixing a little bit of reality with a little bit of not reality, and yet you feel better about it when you wake up. So we can simulate that, and it's based on the strategies used for uh, a therapy called EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprogramming. I haven't been satisfied with the people who do that therapy. I had some training in it myself mm -hmm. in the early days when it was called the No Talk Therapy, which mm -hmm. I completely agree must be No Talk. When people talk about trauma, they re-traumatize themselves. Okay. But the movement of the eyes, what it's doing is it's stimulating one hemisphere of the brain and then the other. Mm -hmm. So I can look at the top left corner and then the top right corner back and forth with my eyes, and I am simulating rapid eye movement in sleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing what I'm calling BLS, bilateral stimulation of the brain. So it's helping. Um, this can be done watching windshield wipers, it can be done tapping the knees with the hands crossed, mm -hmm. or it can be done in what we call the butterfly hug, right. which is simply tapping across the chest. Now, this uh, movement of the eyes has been used to uh, help veterans in the veteran hospital overcome flashbacks and nightmares and actually mm -hmm. leave the hospital and go home. Wow. The butterfly hug has been used to treat children who survived a tsunami uh, the knee wow. tapping is just another form of bilateral stimulation. So you're doing the natural thing that the body does to heal emotional stress, emotional overwhelm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty simple to do. Nobody has to know you're doing it. You can tap your knees under your desk. You can watch your windshield wipers or mm -hmm. look from one corner to the other. Uh, and it is very helpful to men who 
first of all, have to learn to identify is what's going on for me right now that is just too much, you know, for emotions. Oh, emotional flooding. That's what Gottman calls it. And he says that women process with their emotions. So in marriage, what they'll do, if there's a problem, is they will do what it's necessary to cause emotional flooding in their husband. And of course, then he's paralyzed and he can't do anything with it. So uh, go off someplace and do some bilateral stimulation. Yeah. So some of the men in my groups do this regularly, 15 minutes, three times a week right. to make sure they're processing any kind of trauma. You don't have to know what you're doing. You, you simply think about what bothers you. You think about it and do this 15 minutes and you find that you don't have the same strength of response that you had before, where it just seems like I'm stuck, you know, and I don't really know what to do. Wow, and these techniques, uh, tapping here, tapping there, and the eye movement, is it a combo of all three, or is it just one of them? Or? It doesn't matter, you, you can choose what's comfortable for you. Um, just think of it as this, what you're doing is stimulating one hemisphere of the brain and then the other. Hmm. Um, and the crossing is because you know how the right side is controlled by the left brain, right. all that. So you have to cross to, to get the benefit of what happens naturally in our sleep. Um, Beautiful. And so this allows us to come to an emotional uh, balance, which stops at least the extra tendency for this kind of thing from happening. Right. So what has happened is people have used masturbation to regulate this emotional overwhelm or emotional flooding, mm -hmm. or they've used masturbation to pretend that they're not lonely or that something is exciting is happening, they're not bored. Um, in every way, it's an impotent conquest because when it's over, uh, you still have the same problem. It's sort of like the person that drinks or shoots up heroin for their problems. In the end, those problems continue to snowball, and now you have the new problem on top of that. Right. That's why I say it's damaging the very little bit of skill set that the person has to begin with. Scientists are discovering a neurochemical hangover after sexual satiety, which, if overridden by more ejaculation, adversely affects mood and the ability to cope with stimulants. Scientists conduct numerous experiments on male rats in a quest to understand more about human male sexuality. One of the most prolific research teams is in Mexico City, which published an intriguing study revealing that after a rat satiates himself sexually, he exhibits an internal cycle of miserable effects. This natural cycle, which is apparently the first part of an even longer cycle, lasting 96 hours. During this time, the rat's sexual motivation, or libido, is nil to sluggish, and he is hyper-reactive to a variety of drugs. After four days, he is able to copulate more than once, but it will take him 15 days to return to maximum studliness. According to the scientists, the long-lasting character of both sluggish libido and hypersensitivity can be explained by the occurrence of brain plastic charges that, interestingly, disappear gradually in time. They note that the effects of repeated ejaculation can mimic the effects of drug abuse. The mesolimbic system, or reward circuit, plays a role in the processing of natural rewards, including sexual behavior. Constant stimulation of this circuit by repeated administration of drugs produces behavioral sensitization that resembles the drug hypersensitivity exhibited by sexually exhausted rats after repeated ejaculation in a short period, which would continually stimulate the mesolimbic system. Humans may not be very different with respect to any of the mechanisms just described. Sexual stimulation and addictive drugs activate the exact same reward circuit nerve cells. In contrast, there is only a small percentage of nerve cell activation overlap between addictive drugs and other natural rewards, such as food or water. Turning on the same nerve cell that makes sexual stimulation so compelling helps to explain why illegal substances such as methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin can be so addictive. Interestingly, heroin addicts often claim that injecting the drugs feels like an orgasm. Supporting their experience, ejaculation mimics the effects of heroin addiction on the same reward circuit nerve cells. Specifically, ejaculation shrinks the same dopamine-producing nerve cells that shrink with chronic heroin use. One of the other debilitating effects of masturbation is intimacy impotence, the increasing inability of a man or woman to connect, bond, and truly be one with his or her partner. 
to enjoy full intimacy, which is physical, emotional, and spiritual. Instead, he or she might opt for self-sex in the company of cold, imaginary, and fantasy images. Now, you say an impotent conquest. What do you mean by that? Well, I think the part about that women don't have a need or a desire to conquer something. They don't have a huge need. Men do. They really feel like men whenever they've conquered something. And pornography plays on that. Uh, even the video games really do play on that mm -hmm. sense of now you've conquered something. You sure. know, Now you have something you've conquered. So an impotent conquest would be, it's my word, but uh, you don't feel virile afterwards. You don't feel potent. You just don't. Uh, wind up with this feeling of masculine confidence when it's mm -hmm. over. It was a deceptive type of conquest right. that leaves you back at square one or further behind. Mm -hmm. So, what would then a, a real conquest be in the in the context? I guess where most people are experiencing it, it's it's uh, maybe frustration with a family situation with your wife, perhaps probably most commonly. Um, how do we? What's a what's a legitimate conquest for a man? It, what I think the focus has to be is how do men help other men build confidence in themselves? And this little saying I said earlier about strength in your heart to suffer, to act, and to be silent. Whenever you enter into this, you recognize that there is a, such a thing as evil, and you will have to enter into spiritual battle, and there will be suffering. A man has a, a, a potent, a worthwhile conquest when he chooses to suffer for a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a redemptive su a suffering when he chooses to be silent when he didn't have to, mm -hmm. and when he chooses to act appropriately to do something that makes him feel good about himself. The most common thing is when your wife and your children, especially adult children, are in disagreement. Mm -hmm. And you look at the situation and you cannot wrap your mind around what your wife's talking about, but you do agree with everything the adult child is saying, you have to cover the wife. <laughs> your vocation mm -hmm. is to her, you know, you conferred the sacrament, not the priest. You, the spouse confers the sacrament on the spouse. You have to step up to the plate and cover her and have her back and take that moment f to protect her and, mm -hmm. and not say, you know, I really understand what you're talking about, adult child. <laughs> yeah, not the right time. And so that example has helped more men. And they come back to group and talk about how good it felt whenever their wife was actually surprised and... Uh, so the women say the most they don't feel supported by their husbands. Men say they don't feel respected by their wives. Yeah. That word respect is the one I hear all the time. At the moment that the woman feels supported, like you had her back, and it's not really about you making any sense out of what she's saying. That, that is not the game. Mm -hmm. The game is not to figure out what makes sense about what she's saying. It's just to be there, to be the support, and to show that you're the umbrella. And then once she feels supported, it's just automatic. She will do things that men say, I feel respected by her. Mm. You know, I knew it was the right thing to do. It was the right moment to be silent or to suffer or to act. And that's one of the examples of to act in the right way. Mm. In the compendium of the catechism, it says we cooperate with divine grace, we, with divine providence in our actions, our prayers, and our sufferings. And so I changed the word prayers to silence because Mary was a woman of silence. Joseph was a man of silence you know that we're not going to hear God if all our prayers are words and mm -hmm. petitions, but to uh, to be silent in relationship as a prayer, to be silent in a moment where you can just let God do whatever, because women can't stop making sense out of it, and they're going to make sense out of your silence in a better positive way if you're covering and if you're there, you know, protective or whatever. Um, than usually what you had to say, hmm. which becomes you talking about a side of the elephant they've never touched. Uh, men are very logical. They want to explain why those feelings can be discounted. Wrong idea. Women process with their emotions. They hmm. make sense out of things with their feelings. Mm -hmm. And it will be illogical, irrational. You know, women have over a 30-day cycle, 30 different concentrations of estrogen and progesterone. So that provides novelty. A man is hardwired to respond to novelty. And the problem with pornography is he can be exposed to so much novelty that uh, it's always new. Everything's always new. And the subtle newness of the woman he's with every day is obscured. You know, it, it can't compete at all. But uh, she's changing and... 
what she's mad at you about today, she may not be mad at you about tomorrow mm -hmm. because she has a different way of making sense out of it. Um, I do recommend that married couples have the woman make a list of 70 things that make her feel loved, 70, and then wow. ask the man to choose 9 to 12 of them, so around 10 that he'll choose to do for her to help her feel loved because once she feels loved, um, it, it gets better. She responds better and, uh, and things start to improve. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked her to make 70 and him to choose 9 to 12 so that, number one, she's not telling him what to do. Mm -hmm. It's more like a playbook. If you became a football coach and I gave you a book with 70 plays and you choose about a dozen. Mm -hmm. So the man's at the wheel. He can do what he wants, whichever ones. And like I tell him, when you get this list, remember, you're going to take a black marks a lot, scratch out up to 61, and never think about them again. And they can do that. They can do that. And then helping the woman figure out what it is that makes her feel loved. Is it gifts? Is it time spent with her? Is it thank yous and you're pretty and I love yous? You know, is it uh, paint the laundry room, get the car fixed, whatever it is. Get her list going of, of what it is that you've done that helps her feel loved or that you've never done that you might mm -hmm. try. So to start with, I always start with the man. He's supposed to be the spiritual head of the family. What can he do? Number one, stop guessing what she wants. She doesn't even know. I've never seen a woman make this list like in five minutes time. Mm -hmm. They're calling and they're getting help trying to figure out what is it that helps them feel loved. So once she figures out what it is, then you'll, you know, you'll know why you couldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> and now you have some concrete things that you can do, mm -hmm. that you can actually do to help make her feel husbanded. You know, mm. when you think about Jesus meeting the woman at the well and telling her you've been married but never husbanded. So helping men to look at her and ask her to help me husband you, you know, what is going to help you feel good? Instead of what's going on now is a lot of mothering. Most marital relationships, you know, it's the, the mother. She's spending all day with the children, giving them permission and punishment. And her spouse comes home and she's still giving him permission or no permission and punishment mm -hmm. for what he does wrong. And this is a bad relationship. It's not mm -hmm. a spousal relationship. Mm -hmm. So I try to get people to look at what is marriage? It's a vocation. It's for the salvation of your soul. And who confers it? You confer it on each other. And are you as a man allowing God to use you to show his face to your wife? She looks at you and sees the face of God. This is the best way to break all the self-pity and resentment, you know, which is the biggest way we obstruct grace mm -hmm. is we caught, we're caught up in, you know, God, why don't you do what I tell you to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and why did you give me this cross? This cross, this suffering that each one of us has is exactly what we need to learn about love. And we do learn about love through that cross. So to accept it, and to allow God to use you as an instrument to show his face, to make that person feel like they're wanted and they're chosen, um, which is what people are pretending to do in masturbation. They're pretending they're wanted. They're pretending they're chosen, and they're seeking a chemical high. You know, the, mm -hmm. the brain gives a chemical high, a false chemical high, uh, similar to a heroin addict. You know, they're seeking a false high. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's an escape that really gets you more lost than you were to begin with. So uh, until people really deal with their emotional needs, their traumas, their understandings, their self-confidence, um, that they have some things that are working, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. are helping make things better. And, and men really do like to do that. They like a practical tool and they Absolutely. use it and it worked and things got better. Mm -hmm. And in group, you know, we go around and each one tells which tool he used and mm -hmm. how it worked and how it helped. And they all pick something different, you mm -hmm. know, each person, but to know what the different ones are. So if you're trying to help another man, you won't assume that what you used is going to help him or be right. the right answer. Uh, in training the priest, it was really giving them all kinds of different things, especially with different personalities that would be more helpful to one man versus another man and mm -hmm. where the problem may lie in what's going on with him. I would say that men don't connect. They don't have social support. Mm -hmm. And I typically have a brick in the wall exercise where you picture yourself as a center brick and you need two bricks above you mentoring you, two bricks beside you as peers and two bricks below that you mentor. So you can have sons that you mentor or volunteer work you need two peers and you need two mentors. So then you have a solid support. So some men will put those names of those bricks. You know, they've got two guys they look up to, but do they call them when they lose their job? No. Mm -hmm. You know, when a man is out of work, whether he's retired 
are unemployed, he has the same emotional response as a woman whose child has died. And the grieving wow. process is just left untouched and unhealed. Hmm. So to help men know, you have to connect with another man. Now, women use four to 20,000 words a day. Men use up to 2,000 words a day. So women will always tell you, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, share your feelings. Did you talk to your son? What did you say? Did you ask? You don't have to do that. You don't need the words. What men need is fathering. And fathering happens with a man being around, just the presence. So men that have no friends and they don't know anybody, I tell them, go someplace, like go to a gym every Tuesday at four o'clock. Find a guy that's always on a certain machine. Get on the machine next to him. And every Tuesday at four o'clock, work out next to that guy. I don't care if you never speak to him or look at him. That's the fathering, the presence of other men. Hmm. The focus is not what you say, what you disclose, and how much you tell. All the women will tell you that because women must process their emotions hmm. and they are dependent on the words. You know, mm -hmm. you, you see, there's this yeah. big difference of how their advice isn't, you know, so big deal if you never talk, right? Yeah. Lots of men had a good dad who never said a word to them. St. Joseph, <laughs> he is very silent. But to be in the presence of men, to make mm -hmm. time for it and to be there with them and to begin to feel like a good man. Wow. So when a man looks at another man and gives him the, you're man enough, it's, it's building up the culture. It's really building up the culture. Because men that are pretending and looking at pornography, they really are left with, you're never man enough. Uh, their, their focus becomes... <laughs> the advertisements for Viagra, et cetera, or how big I am, how long I last. I mean, that's not the focus of life. It's really about how confident I am as a man to handle what I need to make sure I'm getting it and so that I can feel good about what I'm conquering in myself and what I'm doing for my family. Absolutely beautiful. Whoa, what an amazing amount of information. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Bro, for joining us here on Truth and Lies. I think you have really, really helped uh, us come to a fuller understanding of truth. I want to uh, give people some resources. Where can they go, first of all, to find more information, to find you online, to get some counseling, perhaps? Where can they go? Well, I have a website. It's mm -hmm. drmonicabro.com, but not everybody knows how to spell my mm -hmm. name. It's easier to find me on catholictherapist.com. Okay. And... Um, People frequently say I'm the only one in Arizona. On Catholic Therapist, you can search by my first name, Monica, mm -hmm. or I'm in Phoenix, uh, and uh, there are links to my website there and how to get in contact with me. Uh, and I'm really interested in promoting the Holy Men program. It's W-H-O-L-L-Y, Holy Men. Let me just show Men. this little slide of that so hopefully they can see it. That's the program there, Holy Bed program. Yeah, it's... Um, to build leaders in the fight against the pornography plague, the men who attend, it's not an admission of a pornography problem. I mean, people are never dis required to disclose anything about themselves. It's really uh, focused on the things I talked about, the emasculation in the culture, the need for impulse control, for emotional regulation, especially uh, helping with marital issues and building up your marriage to be what you, what you would like for it to be. Uh, it's an educational program. It's not group therapy, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just been very helpful as passing on these techniques and hearing other guys when and how they use the techniques and how it worked out for them. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, my friends, we have once again been given a wealth of information, facts that prove the truth of God that is taught by His church. Have your opinions shifted during the course of our discussions? Do you feel more ready now to answer those tough questions people have? It's my hope that you do feel more ready, ready to do so with love. Scripture tells us that we will never be tempted beyond our means. And with great servants of God like Dr. Bro to help us out when we need, we will have the strength we need to continue in faith. We want to hear from you here at Truth and Lies. Please let us know if there are any other topics that you'd like us to cover. You can do that at hashtag truth and lies and visit us online at shalomworld.org slash truth and lies. And until next time, my friends, go forth and speak the truth with love. God bless you. <laughs>